and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tank Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Ikaika Anderson. Ikaika means strong in Hawaiian. Dustin Michael, also known as Ikaika Anderson, is best known as being the chair of the Honolulu City Council, he recently resigned and is now with the Plasterers and Mason Union. His family members, Whitney and Anderson, were both in public office. Ikaika, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Please tell us a little about yourself and why you are in politics. Aloha, Dennis. First of all, I'd like to thank you folks very much for having me on Think Tech today and allowing me the opportunity to talk story with you for a bit. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Ikaika Anderson. I am the former chair of the Honolulu City Council. I served on the council for a little more than 11 years, served for a year and a half as council chairman, served for six years as council vice chairman, and for a little more than six years as the council's zoning and planning chairman, where I was the architect of the transit-oriented development, uh, land use policy, as well as overall land use policy for the council. In addition uh, to that, Dennis, I am also a father of four children. My oldest daughter, uh, Tiani, is 20. She's happily married to Mikkel, who is a cryptologist in US Naval Intelligence. My oldest son, Justin, is a senior at Kaiser High School. And my twins, son Caleb and daughter Kylie, are 11 years old and at New Valley Middle School. OK, uh, what do you miss the most about being on the city council, especially being the chair? I miss most of, uh, about being on the council. People I served and the colleagues that I worked with, Dennis, I, were, I had the amazing opportunity to work with a great group of colleagues, including uh, Ann Kobayashi, uh, Tommy Waters, Brandon Elefante, uh, Ron Menor, Ernie Martin, uh, Todd Apoll over the years. I also had the most amazing staff that any elected official could ever. You know, Dennis, any elected official is really only as good as the staff that they have. Uh, mine was truly the best. My chief of staff, uh, Andrew Malahoff, I knew for more than 35 years. He and I went to middle school together. Uh, Alan Teixeira, my deputy chief of staff, I knew for about the same amount of time. Uh, Francisco Figueredo, I've known for more than 25 years. So I, that really gave me the opportunity for me to know my staff and for my staff to know me and for us all to be comfortable uh, with one another. And as I said earlier, really an elected official is only as good as their staff. Uh, I'm also a caregiver to my grandparents. I was raised by my grandparents, uh, Whitney Anderson, former uh, state legislator, uh, serving in both the House and the Senate for a total of 20 years. And my grandmother, Hanny Anderson, who was an executive in the local airline and travel industry for more than 40 years. And my pop is gonna be 90 in December. My tutu will be 87 in January. I assist my mom and my stepfather in taking my grandparents to their doctor appointments to do shopping, or I'll do it for them, uh, to pick up their medications and also to be here to assist with their daily living, Dennis. I'm very fortunate. Uh, my family and I are very fortunate. Uh, my children and I share property with my grandparents, so they live right across the lawn from us. You open my front door and walk across the lawn, and I'm on my grandparents' porch. So my children have the opportunity to eat dinner with their great grandparents almost every day, uh, which has also given uh, my Kiki a, a very solid opportunity, which really isn't afforded to all that many to get to spend quality time with their great grandparents. I believe uh, when I saw you on Maui, uh, you, uh, was it Whitney with you? Yes. At, uh, at Richard Minotaur's, uh you know, service. Yes, my grandfather has been had been friends with Richard Minatoya and uh, former state senator Joe Tanaka for a number of years. As you know, Richard Minatoya uh, served staff of former Senator Tanaka for a number of years. So we had the opportunity to uh, be friends with both of those gentlemen. Prior to being the chair, you're the uh, chair of the council. You're the chair of the Transportation and Planning Committee, which leads us to the rail. Yeah. So what is your take on the rail right now? Right before I left the council, Dennis, I introduced a proposed charter amendment to abolish the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation. I just feel that heart has outlived its usefulness and its purpose. 
and that Honolulu's elected official, the nine member Honolulu City Council and the mayor are in better positions to complete rails construction. Uh, Hart largely is unanswerable to anyone after their appointment. Uh, I would surmise to say, Dennis, that if I were to walk into a local restaurant on Oahu today, pick a location, and ask folks to name me five hard board members, most folks wouldn't be able to do it. Additionally, when there's an issue with rail and the general public wants to contact someone from the heart board, in addition to not knowing who to contact, even if they're able to reach someone, these folks really aren't directly accountable to the public as an elected official is. So I felt that it would be best to return the construction management of heart to the council and to the mayor. So at least someone who's directly accountable or a group of people who are directly accountable to the general public would be charged with finishing up the project. The heart chair, Pauline Hanapusa was just uh, on a show with Yonji Denise and Ryan Suji. And she claimed that the estimated budget shortfall of 3.5 billion was wrong and perhaps only 2 billion and don't play the other negatives. Any thoughts on that? You're going to hear a numbers uh, being given from the heart board, from the heart staff, as to exactly what the shortfall is, as well as the reasonings for the shortfalls. Again, if we have the elected officials be charged with finishing this project, I just feel that the accountability really stops on the desks, the elected officials anyway. But right now, Honolulu's charter has the authority for finishing the project or not up to the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation Board of Directors and the staff. Really, this decision should return to the elected officials in Honolulu and let them be held accountable for those decisions that they make. Right now, a lot of them are held accountable, but they don't have the jurisdiction to make the decision. Yeah, you know, we had, in the past, we had problems, one problem after another. One was the, the problem with the shim. When I asked, I asked Bill Brennan at a meeting once, you know, about it, and he don't play it, saying it was like the spaces, uh, the uh, spacing on the toilet seat cover. I mean, I think it's a big difference. Now they have problem with the real frogs, as they call it, or something. Uh, yes, as well as the tracks. Yeah. So, do so you see uh, state getting more involved in giving them? more money or besides giving them more money? The state has gotten more involved in appointing non-voting members to the transit authority. But again, Dennis, the accountability of any of these members, whether they be from the appointed from the state legislature, from the city council or from the mayor, still not directly accountable to the public. And as I mentioned earlier, the issue is really on the desks of the nine council members and the mayor. I think it's time to have those folks then have the authority as well to deal with that issue directly that's on their desk. That's really the only way to do it. Abolish heart and allow the decision-making to occur at the city council level and at the mayoral level. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, that's, we could go on forever <laughs> on talking about the rail. Anyway, you know, we'll kind of tie it into the rail. You got housing, uh, well, one of the things I think you discussed and it showed on one of your photos, uh, you're questioning some condos since uh, they're going to be, was it to sell people in China? A foreign developer came to Honolulu a few years ago uh, proposing a new development. And when this developer first came to Honolulu, the developer promised to utilize a local general contractor who would in turn hire local labor and use local suppliers. That developer then reneged on that promise to the people of Honolulu and to the Honolulu City Council by firing the general contractor, the local general contractor, and then proposing to bring in foreign labor. And at that point, I publicly told that developer to take their money, take their project, and beat it, go home because it isn't gonna to be tolerated here in Honolulu. And he had told me that in other areas outside the country, as well as on the mainland where he had done business, it was cheaper to do business. 
And my response to him was, well, good, then go do your project wherever you did your projects in, in the past. But you're not gonna come here to Honolulu and lie to our people and lie to our government after you get your approvals. We're not gonna stand that. Uh, some folks didn't like what I said or the way that I put it. But Dennis, I've always been uh, upfront when I'm asked a question and brutally honest. <laughs> Sometimes my staff members would even cringe when I give an answer <laughs> to a question. But if you ask me a question, Every time you're going to get an honest answer. It may not be the one you want, but I'm always going to give you an honest answer. That's the only way I know how to do it. So what happened to that developer? His project is still in limbo. Still in limbo, still not finished. Oh, it, I mean, it's under construction? Not even. Oh. My understanding is the developer is looking to sell the, uh, the developer is looking to sell the property. Because one of the senators went to Singapore and came back and said, you know, we're going to, we got to copy them. So everybody talking about the Singapore model of housing, and you know, especially with the, the trend, uh, transit oriented housing and stuff. What do you think about that? I do like the concept. Uh, I I believe that in order to provide more workforce housing uh, under the United States Housing and Urban Development uh, Income Guidelines and and Family Guidelines that we're really going to need to build denser, if that's even a word, but we need to increase density. Really, that's what transit-oriented development or TOD allows. It allows us as government to increase density around the public transit stations. It allows us to go higher, and it also allows us to increase floor density. Really, Dennis, I think that is part of the solution. I strongly believe that's part of the solution to workforce housing is increasing density around our public transit stations. I would also propose that to help our homeless population, that we look more towards the Kauhale concept. Roughly two years ago, I worked with Lieutenant Governor Josh Green and a Waimanaupuna anti Blanche McMillan to bring to fruition uh, one of the first, if not the first, Kauhale projects in the state, in Waimanalo. And what we did is we brought together dozens of people who were living homeless outside of Waimanalo Beach Park and transitioned them into housing on a state-owned property where Anthony McMillan held a lease to. Uh, I identified Auntie Blanche as a community leader who held that lease. And then we went and worked with Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, who convinced the State Department of Land and Natural Resources to allow the project to move forward and to happen on DLNR own land. So really, that's a shining example of what happened when you have different branches of government come together. And Josh and I were able to bring forward the nonprofit sector, the labor sector, as well as the nonprofit and the faith-based sectors to provide this housing opportunity. And as proof that this can be copied, Dennis, there was a blessing uh, just recently, I believe it was yesterday, in fact, in uh, West Oahu, out in Kalailoa of a very similar project that came to fruition with the help of Homemade, with the help of the Lieutenant Governor, and with the help of the uh, labor community as well as the food Yeah, community. yeah that, uh, I'm glad you know you and your buddy doing uh, a lot in that section. However, with the median price of home being about a million dollars, like the, the middle class, working class having a hard time getting houses, and uh, uh, I think we need more help there. We certainly do need more help there. And likewise, I believe the answer is looking for government-owned property so that we can remove the highest hurdle to workforce housing, which is the cost of land. And then in a similar effort, as was, as was done with the Kauhale projects, you bring forth the labor community, the nonprofit community, as well as the faith-based community to be able to provide the services and to bring the housing into existence. That's really what's needed. And it, it's proven, Dennis, that that formula works. I believe it was that early in the uh, 1990s. I was with the HFDC and uh, we did a lot of housing using that uh, similar method. Um, you're part native Hawaiian and went to Kamehameha schools, right? Yes, I am a Kamehameha okay. school graduate. Yeah. So um, how do you see the HHL and OHA helping the Hawaiians? I would like to see the Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, do more rental housing. 
I know that with the leases being a dollar a year uh, for 99 years allows for the homes uh, to be affordable by most standards. But many Native Hawaiians, for whatever reason, cannot qualify for a mortgage, whether it be due to credit issues or income issues. Many cannot, qualif cannot qualify for a mortgage, but they could certainly qualify for home rental program and home rental assistance. I would ask the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to look at properties in the transit-oriented development or TOD districts around uh, the mass transit stations and look to build vertical there. That's a model that I believe could work. And as a Native Hawaiian myself, I would ask uh, the governor, if I elected lieutenant governor, uh, for a very active role in working with the Hawaiian community to decide upon who the next director of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and the chair of the Hawaiian Homes Commission would be. Uh, partnering with Self-Help Housing Corp or Habitat for Humanity seems to help over here on Kauai. Uh, Certainly has. Lines, yeah. Certainly has. Yeah. But I would like to see the Department of Hawaiian Homelands put some more effort into rental housing. I think that's a solid component to providing additional homes for DHHL beneficiaries. I'm not saying it's not being done, but I believe that the department needs to put more emphasis on rental housing, really need to put more emphasis on rental housing. And to do that, uh, we need a director who understands development and knows how to bring various development partners together and uh, understand how to acquire additional lands. So you touched upon it. You know, the lieutenant governor doesn't have any specific uh, responsibility, I think. And you're not a doctor, so you kind of give daily reports. So uh, uh, <laughs> it's good that you're talking about housing or, you know, working with housing, which uh, is not much needed. Um, okay, and moving on to... Tourism, uh, I spoke to a hotel in Waikiki and their occupancy is down. Yes. And, ex and expected to get worse, you know, this year before it gets yes. better. Uh, everyone says we need, we need a tourist money and we need a balance. So what do you say to that? I believe that the Lieutenant Governor's office can work with the next governor on visitor industry management. I'm the only candidate running for lieutenant governor who has any direct experience in visitor industry management. Uh, more than 10 years ago, when I first joined the Honolulu City Council, the winner of Oahu community that elected me was screaming for someone at some level of government to manage the visitor industry. We had an overabundance of commercial activities that took over some of our beach parks and had also flooded into uh, the windward community. Kailua, Waimanalo in particular. After talking to our community, what I proposed wasn't canceling the industry or telling the visitor industry to leave. We didn't do any of that. What we did is we told the visitor industry, while we're not telling you to leave, we are going to manage how you come into our community and how you utilize our natural resources. So for starters, the Honolulu City Council decided that no commercial activities would be allowed at any beach park in Kailua passed an ordinance to do that. Then through a handshake agreement with the largest commercial landowner in Kailua at that time, I got the landowner to agree that their commercially zoned properties where they were legally allowed to conduct visitor uh, commercial activities on would no longer be uh, done by them and instead would take place only at the large parking lot at, at the former Macy site. And that handshake agreement, Dennis, is still in effect today. So while you do have visitors coming to Kailua Beach Park, coming into Kailua and even to Waimanalo, for Kailua, if folks are gonna get on a bus, that tour bus is going to take them to the former Macy's lot. Folks are gonna get off there. They're going to patronize our local bike rental shops. They're also going to utilize our city bus services to get to where they wanna go. Some folks are going to rent rental cars and come in on their own. But what this has resulted in is our beach park parking lots being available to the residents of Honolulu who pay for those services. And I believe that that model could certainly be applied on a larger scale. Look at Maui County. The Maui County Council is already proposing a ban on any new permits being issued in resort areas. 
And that type of activity is going to continue from local governments until and unless some, for, some governmental entity gets together to manage the visitor industry. I did it in Kailua and Windward Oahu, and I can do it again as Lieutenant Governor. I have a proven track record on that. Okay. There's talk about getting the uh, visitors more involved in uh, cultural things in the true to, I don't know, visitor industry management. Uh, what do you know about that? There are a number of opportunities, especially through ecotourism, to get visitors more involved. And I would hold, I do wholeheartedly support that. But at the same time, government needs to realize that we cannot, as a community, as a Hawaii community, bring more than 10 million visitors into our islands anymore and believe that we're still going to be able to sustain all of our natural resources. Cannot. It's just not possible to do. And it's also worth noting that with a little more than 10 million visitors, state revenues are less with that than they were years ago with less visitors. Why is that? Because I believe today we're attracting the wrong type of visitors. We need to encourage bringing visitors here who are going to spend more money and less of those visitors who are going to spend more money than bringing in more visitors who are going to spend less money. If we can continue to keep Hawaii a good place to live, it's going to be a good place to visit, but we shouldn't be doing it the other way around. Got to be focused on the residents first. Um, you know, like you said, focus on the residents, but then, you know, you got some uh, Kamaana who moved away, you know, then they'll become visitors when they come back here. You know, like they might not be the, the really rich ones. I mean, you still got to yeah, uh, embrace them. And same as when we go, you know, we're not the, yes. we're not the filthy rich, you know, visitor at, uh, elsewhere. So, you know, there got to be some balance. You cannot just say only the rich get come or something like that, right? No, I'm not saying that we would, we, we would turn into a destination where only the wealthy can come. But when you have a mainland airline coming to do business here, offering $200 round trip tickets, and we're expecting that we're going to bring more of those visitors in, and that they're going to spend the dollars that we need to sustain our economy. And at the same time, they're not going to ruin what we have. I believe we're sorely mistaken. Yeah. Not going to happen. Moving on to uh, the topic, the uh, Aloha Stadium. What do you think we should do? I do believe that there's room for a housing component at Aloha Stadium. Uh, I do agree with former governors Cayetano, Waihe'e, and Abercrombie that a smaller stadium would work for us. I think a 50,000 uh, seat arena or even a 40,000 seat arena in today's market for Hawaii, if we're focusing on Hawaii primarily, is too large. You know, we saw the University of Hawaii retrofit the Ching Athletic Complex from what it was, then planning a, a smaller footprint before turning it into what it is now in a year, maybe less than a year. If the university is able to do that on that type of a, a time frame, I'd like to hear what the university believes as far as uh, the feasibility of building a stadium on campus. And I'm very interested to hear the university leadership's perspective on whether or not the university has that capacity to do this. I do believe the potential is there. And I believe this is an idea that's worth considering. But we're also going to have to have detailed discussions with the legislators representing the Manoa community from the state representative to the state senator to the city council member. But I believe that's an idea very worth considering. Yeah. It would also and certainly encourage a, a lot more student participation in sports. And as a UH alumnus myself, I do believe that college athletics is a huge part of campus life and of college life and college experience. Yeah, I grew up with the old stadium in Moilili. So that was that was the whole one. Um, so we're looking at housing at the existing Aloha Stadium site then. I believe housing there makes sense. A, a, a rail transit station is proposed to be adjacent to that facility. It makes sense. Uh, Multi-use land use development makes sense. From retail to uh, residential to some component of sports, if it's feasible, makes sense. But that entire area is ripe for transit-oriented development. Uh, 
and we should do it there. It makes sense to do it there. But I do think that affordable housing has to be a component there. You want to encourage people to live, if not at, at the very least, nearby where they work. Okay, Perfect thanks. opportunity at a low state. Okay, thanks. Uh, we don't have much time, but uh, this is a fit, federal uh, act. But uh, what do you think about the Jones Act? Uh, I had an opportunity to look at Jones Act policy a few years back. And really, the Jones Act policy is a lot more than just looking at the price of goods. You really need to go back and take a look at the study that the United States Government Accountability Office, the research arm office of Congress, did into this issue. You can seek an exemption, but also need to understand when you seek exemptions, the level of service that is scheduled also comes into play and is at risk. With the Jones Act, Hawaii receives scheduled service like clockwork of these ships coming in and going out. So our people are able to get the goods that we need on a timely basis. Without the Jones Act, that scheduling comes into play, according to the Government Accountability Office research. Before I could say, yes, an exemption is great and we should move forward with it, I would need to be made absolutely sure and comfortable that the level of service not going to decrease. Level of service cannot decrease when we're in an island state like this. Well, and, and, the, and the prices of uh, shipping goods. Okay, we've only got a short time left. You got any closing statements, a sharp one? Again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity, uh, Dennis, to talk story with you. Yeah. I look forward to talking with people across the state. If you look at my campaign, uh, many of the folks supporting me across the state have been involved primarily at the local government level. Uh, these are folks who know their communities, uh, who live in their communities just like I do. Granted, I served as the chair of the Honolulu City Council, which is the most urban council in the state. Uh, but I live in Waimanalo and drove into town every day uh, for work. I understand our rural people. I understand our rural lifestyle. And with me as lieutenant governor, nobody across Hawaii is going to feel that they're left alone. I understand all of our residents. And I look forward to being able to talk with people across our state as we move forward. Uh, truly, Dennis, I'm looking forward to making my campaign Hawaii Heart and Soul. Ikaika, thank you for joining us today. Good luck and best wishes to you and your Ohana. Mahalo you're, nui. You've been, yeah. you've been watching Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Esaki on Think Tech Hawaii, a 501c3 nonprofit. If you like the show, please tell your friends and help support Think Tech Hawaii and their wonderful staff and volunteers. Mahalo, aloha, ahoi ho, malama pono.